But why does the epigenome change when the genome does not? In Montreal, scientists Michael Meany and Moshe Schiff believe the question contains its own answer. We have this very, very static genome, very hard to change. It could be only changed by really dramatic things like nuclear explosions or, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. On the other hand, we have the dynamic environment that changes all the time. And so what there is here is an interface between the highly dynamic world around us and the highly static genome that we have. Epigenome is an in-between creature, built in a way to respond to changes around us. Schiff and Meany believe that experience itself changes the epigenome. To reach this startling conclusion, they studied two kinds of rats. Those born to nurturing mothers who licked and groomed them intensely after birth, and those born to mothers who took a more pause-off approach. What we were particularly interested in is the way in which these animals might respond to stressful events. And we found the offspring of low-licking mothers during periods of stress show greater increases in blood pressure and greater increases in stress hormone production. They will scream. They will try to bite you. Just walking into their cage, those rats will respond differently. To rule out a genetic cause, High-licking mothers were given the babies of low-licking ones and vice versa. Once again, the less nurtured pups grew up markedly different, and not only on blood tests. So the conclusion from that is, it's not the genes that the mother brings into the game. It is the behavior of the mother that has an impact on the offspring years after the mother is already gone. And the basic question was, how does the rat remember what kind of care it received from its mother so that it now has better or worse health conditions? And we reasoned that there must be some mark in genes that marks that memory. But could such a mark capturing memory be found? The researchers focused on a gene which lowers the levels of stress hormones in the blood. It's active in a part of the rat's brain called the hippocampus. By extracting and analyzing the gene, they could compare how its activity varied between low and high licked rats. The difference was striking. Less nurtured rats had multiple epigenetic marks silencing the gene. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and all the 17 Cs in the gene are methylated in the The world. result? With the gene less active, stress levels in neglected rats soared. Now let's look at the highs. In stark contrast, nurtured rats could better handle stress because they had nothing dimming the gene's activity. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nothing there. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, nothing. Gone. It's all empty, nothing there. The maternal behavior essentially sculpted the genome of their babies. We looked at one gene. We know 100 genes were changed. But for me, it was a fantastic thing that just a behavior of one subject can change the gene expression in a different subject. The most surprising phase of the experiment, however, was yet to come. Schiff and Meany injected anxious rats with a drug known to remove epigenetic marks. And as we injected the drug, the gene turned on. And when it turned on, the entire behavior of the rat changed. It became less anxious. Also, it responded to stress, like a normally reared rat. And we looked at the way that gene was marked in the brain. And we saw that we actually changed the epigenetic marking of that gene. See, there's nothing there, huh? It's empty. So there's empty. Completely empty. Yeah. 
Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Although the work has yet to be replicated, it appears that Schiff and Meany have linked personality traits, albeit in a rat, to the epigenome. Could this have implications for humans? We will not know until the completion of a 10-year study now underway that will look at children from both nurturing and neglected backgrounds. But even now, says Meany, we have clues that our own upbringings produce the same effects. If you grow up in a family that involves abuse, neglect, harsh and inconsistent discipline, then you are statistically more likely to develop depression, anxiety, drug abuse. And I don't think that surprises anyone. But what is interesting is that you are also more likely to develop diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. And the stress hormones actively promote the development of these individual diseases. So one day we'll be able perhaps to chart the pathway from child abuse to changes in the way certain genes are epigenetically marked in the brain that unfortunately affect our health years later in life. This work is controversial. Still, many scientists now believe that epigenetic changes in gene expression may underlie human diseases. Take a disorder like MDS, cancer of the blood and bone marrow. It's not a diagnosis you would ever want to hear. When I went in, then he started patting my hand and <laughs> it was going, your blood work does not look very good at all, and that I had um, MDS leukemia, and uh, that there was not a cure for it, and basically I had six months uh, to live. With no viable treatment, Sandra entered a clinical trial experimenting with epigenetic therapy. It was the result of a radical new way of thinking about the causes of diseases like cancer. If one has a genetic basis of cancer in mind, then one is simply asking what causes genetic damage. Cigarette smoking, certain types of environmental exposures and radiation causes genetic damage. But now if I come in and say, well, wait a minute, epigenetic damage can also cause cancer then you've got to ask, well, why does this come about? The trouble begins, believes Isa, when our stem cells, the master cells that create and replace our tissues, overwork. Every time a stem cell has to repair injury, it is aging a little more. And because each time a stem cell divides, there is a finite chance of some sort of epigenetic damage, what we find is that in older people, there's been an accumulation of these epigenetic events that is easily measurable in DNA. Now, where does the cancer angle come from? Well, if you count age as how many times a stem cell has divided, then cancers which copy themselves tirelessly are awfully old tissues. As epigenetic errors pile up, the switches that turn genes on and off can go awry, creating havoc within the cell. There are genes that help to prevent tumors that are normally active, that epigenetically become silenced. Um, those are called tumor suppressor genes. And there are other genes called oncogenes that stimulate the growth of tumors, and then the tags, such as the methylation tags, come off those genes, and those genes become activated. So both ways, turning on and turning off, is a way of getting epigenetic disease. But could misplaced tags be rearranged? In 2004, Sandra and other patients began taking a drug to remove methyl tags, silencing their tumor suppressor genes. Your number one thing is, okay, is it going to work? 
And when you know that before this there was nothing, then yeah, it makes you pretty happy that there is a chance to go forward in your life. Okay, sir, we have started your chemotherapy. Ironically, the drug desitabine was tried in conventional chemotherapy in the 1970s and deemed too toxic. Today, Issa is giving his patients a dose 20 to 30 times lower. The idea of epigenetic therapy is to stay away from killing the cell. Rather, what we are trying to do is diplomacy, trying to change the instructions of the cancer cells, reminding the cell, hey, you're a human cell, you shouldn't be behaving this way. And we try to do that by reactivating genes.